All right. Um, so I'm uh, Aina Northfield, and I'm going to be talking to you today about Mithril. Or you can see my Twitter handle down there. It's at Northfield, and that is also my GitHub handle. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, a bit just high level about what Mithril is, and then I'm going to go into some code examples for you. And in the end, we'll have questions. Or no, let's just have questions after each code example. I think that would be nicer for us. All right. So I'm just going to go straight into it. It works. All right. Um, <laughs> So what is Mithril? Um, in simple terms, Mithril is a client-side MVC framework. And that means it's completely on the client side, the model, the view, and the controller. However, some people have said that frameworks in contrast to libraries dictate how code should be written. And in that sense, you could argue that Mithril is not really a framework because of how it looked into anything. Um, but it instead would be then a tool to organize code in a way that is easy to think about and to maintain. Um, here are some statistics on Mithril. It is extremely lightweight. It is 12 kilobytes gzipped when you have minified it. So the code size is, well, it's the tiniest thing I've ever seen for a, for a client at MVC framework ever. Uh, it has a small API surface. I think it's around 15 methods it exposes and has a small learning curve as a, which is a side effect of this small code size and small API. Uh, the learning curve is also small because of the way we use CSS selectors in when we define our virtual DOM elements. So that is a nice feature. And semicolon. Yeah, that's it. It allows you to create hierarchical MVC components, via uh, components, and yeah. Uh, then we get to the my favorite part. It is fast. It is mind-numbingly fast. Uh, it it uses virtual DOM diffing and compilable templates to achieve this speed, and it also uh, has an intelligent auto redrawing system, meaning that it redraws when it has to, if if it has to, uh, and then it just kind of redraws only what it needs to, and that is a really cool feature. So on this slide, I'm going to show you a bit of how it compares to other frameworks. Um, uh, there are two tests I'm using here. The first is loading time. And as you can see, it kind of wipes the floor in every category with, uh, in regards to the other big frameworks, being jQuery, uh, Backbone, Angular, and React in this case. The reason I'm using loading time and rendering, uh, it's, the, re the rendering test, I should mention, is biased against Mithril in this case. Uh, we, we are not using compiled templates. We're using the whole uh, uncompiled version of Mithril. You know, it, it's, it's not minified in any way. So, um, but in, in all of these tests, so this is just kind of pure Mithril, and it's, it, it's wiping the floor with, with these other frameworks. This is the test you can see below. I put it in an iframe. Um, you can see it's just a bunch of uh, input boxes with uh, some letters inside of them being rendered. And it's just a single page render, which we are measuring. <laughs> so we are measuring the time from when a uh, user clicks a link and until, in, and until he can interact with your web page, which is an important metric when it comes to mobile and such. So what really is different between Mithril and these frameworks? Well, the first is, of course, the code size, which I mentioned. Uh, it kind of refers to two things. The first, the code size of Mithril itself. And secondly, how much less code you can write when you're using Mithril. I'll, I'll get to this later. The second being documentation. Most new frameworks today have kind of lacky documentation. That is not the case with Mithril. And in fact, there is more documentation than code in the Mithril repo. <laughs> and it is all handwritten. That means that for every method in Mithril, you have usage cases and you have handwritten, handcrafted documentation on each and every case you can use the function in, which is really powerful when you're just starting to learn instead of relying on third-party sites <laughs> to, to get to learn the framework. Um, the architecture of Mithril is kind of different from, from most of the other, these other frameworks because the other frameworks kind of give you some really large base classes to extend from. And you need to inherit from these classes, and that can be kind of expensive because you need to in JavaScript, copy all of the methods onto your new class, even if you're only going to use, say, three of them. And the fourth thing that is different is a view layer paradigm. Most other frameworks, that being, when I say other, I, I'm usually referring to Backbone and Ember and things like that, have a sort of procedural view layer. Uh, Mithril has a declarative view layer, and that means that, much like HTML, uh, the same code implicitly does everything that it needs to. Uh, 
when you're writing things in jQuery or Backbone, if you want to display a list, you first need to create your delete method, your update method, and then a render everything method for performance. And this you need to do for every collection you wanted to, wanted to display. That is not the case in Mithril. Now, I'm just going to introduce you to uh, a couple of basic methods in Mithril. The first is the m function. M at the m function is a convenience method to compose virtual DOM elements that can then be rendered by Mithril. And it's got a really nice syntax, at least I think it's one of the nicest syntaxes I have seen for a templating engine. As you can see in the first example, I say m of dot container, and that returns a div with a class of container. Uh, the second is a hash of layout, returning an ID with layout, a div with an ID of layout, and we can use these CSS type of selectors to create virtual DOM elements. Now, um, you can see here in the, in the last example, a of hash google.external with the ref of google.com and comma google would return a, an anchor tag with an ID of google, a class of external, the ref of google, and google being the, the link text. Uh, mounting refers to the process of entering a component into a DOM element, so we use end mount to, to do that. Uh, we, the, the first argument would be a DOM element, and the next being your application, or a middle component. Um, so, uh, shit, there we go. <laughs> oh, I'm on the wrong slide. Uh, follow me. Shit, go back. There we go. Uh, no, there we go. All right, so this is, our, this is the Hello World example of Mithril. You begin by requiring Mithril. You create an app object, or whatever you want to call it. So in Mithril, a component is a plain old JavaScript object which has two methods, a control method and a view method. I say view methods when I mean functions. She should get used to that. And um, here we just have the, the, the controller function being optional. Uh, the view then returns a virtual DOM element of H1 with an hello world, and we mount it to document body. And as you can see, I've put it in an iframe below. So this is kind of the most bare bones situation you can get into in Mithril, and you should notice the lack of boilerplate by now. Uh, simply add Mithril to your page, and you can get going. That is all. So if we wanted to get into two-way data modeling, I remember when everybody was getting into Angular, they were going mind, they were just going mad over this two-way data modeling <laughs> feature. Uh, so this is the example of how we would achieve the same in Mithril. Uh, you begin by uh, creating a controller, and in this case, I put this top name equaling an mprop of an empty string. Uh, mprop is basically a functional getter setter, which is a getter setter function factory. Uh, every, everybody know what that is? All right, good. Um, then in the view, I return two elements, the first being an input element whose value is equal to control name. And on input, we attach an event handler, which is m.withatter, and m.withatter basically accesses the real DOM element, gets its value, and calls a second parameter with that value. Uh, and then we return uh, uh, another DOM element, which is h1, which is hi plus your name. Um, where is my mouse? And as you can see, it functions just properly. Where are we? is highest. All right, so this is the two-way data modeling example. It functions. Uh, one of the things that I've run into with Mithril is actually how I never feel actually locked into the framework. And I wanted to show that here by using just normal array methods to create a view. So here I've just created a user model who ha which has a list function which returns an M request. Now M request returns a promise. And in the future, uh, Leo, the creator of Mithril, has said that he's going to replace the Promise API with uh, the ES6 one when it gets released into the browser. But for now, we're going to use the, uh, use the uh, Mithril Promise version. And uh, yeah, we're just doing an M request, which has an initial value of an array. And yeah, well, this uses then becomes a mprop, which then gets populated with the results of the request. And we just go on with a view and return an, an ordered list and then we map through the user's array and return virtual DOM elements. Any questions around this? Uh, is everything clear? That is great uh, because the next one is really cool. This is one of my favorite examples when it comes to Mithril. Uh, here I am running in the controller a set interval function which runs every 20 milliseconds and I am populating an array with 800 random numbers every 20 milliseconds. You can see this 
blazing fast speed of mythical here really easily but uh, yeah we got a hundred elements but this is what's gonna make you go wow mythical is really cool you see when I select something here it, the selection remains the reason for this <laughs> is that instead of you know removing the DOM and creating a new DOM we're only replacing what is inside of the TD which is part of why Mithril is so fast compared to other frameworks. I think this, yeah, this is such a cool, so cool, <laughs> so cool. <laughs> All right, yeah, um, yeah. As you can see, I'm just returning um, a table with a T head and T body and mapping through the data. Uh, then down here, I have this table style function, which is um, which actually interacts directly with the VDOM. The reason I'm doing this is because if I were to create a re if I wanted to create a reusable component, I wouldn't want to ro lock myself into a framework like Bootstrap. So I can simply interact with the virtual DOM there and add classes to it afterwards, which is you know it, it's a nice pattern to have in your repertoire. Now the question that should be on your mind right now is, wow, that is cool, but can I use existing jQuery plugins? Can I? interact with the JavaScript ecosystem as it is right now? And the answer is, uh, yeah, yeah, you can. <laughs> so here I'm just going to show you how to how we create a simple wrapper around select2. Select2, for those who, yeah, you all know what select2 is. All right, so um, we create a select2 select component, and it simply takes in a controller, and it maps through the controller's data, creates options for the select elements, and then we have this really cool thing here called config. Um, a config function in Mythful is the only way is the only way to interact with the actual DOM, not the virtual DOM. So as you can see in the config function down here, I we get. I use two parameters, but there are actually four parameters you can use. The first being the element, that is the actual DOM node. Second being is initialize, have you run this code before on this node. Uh, third being context, which is something that remains the same uh, through every iteration of, of this config function. And the third being the virtual DOM element. Now what we do is we simply select a, the element with jQuery, and if it is not initialized, we put select two on it. and put an onChange method that calls the controller's onChange method. So that is how you would interact with uh, the actual DOM. And as you can see, I've got a select2 here, and it functions quite well. So you, now you can see what, you know, I, I love this framework. <laughs> So yeah, that was really all I wanted to show you. I just wanted to make this a kind of quick thing, uh, just show you some basics of Mithril and how powerful it really can be in the right hands. And uh, to summarize, this is the entire API surface of Mithril. Um, I put the code examples up on GitHub, on my GitHub. Um, so are there any questions, anything you want to, want to know? I, I, really, I really wanted to, to kind of answer your questions rather than go through a a sort of demo phase any longer. Yeah. So how does it function with like routes? Is it a single page thing? Or is uh, it yeah, you can create single page applications using M routes. Uh, in all of the examples, I use M dot mount. If you wanted to have a routing system, you could use M route instead. And the first argument there would be an, uh, the, the DOM element, of course. And then you would have the second argument being a default route. And the third argument being an object whose keys correspond to the routes, and uh, the value of those keys being the components to route to. Uh, I should have an example of that somewhere, but I actually don't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that it uses promises, and you had this model or something that was returning it from the request. Uh, yeah, let's just go right to it. That was. I have no clue how to use this. So it looked like at some point uh, yeah, was there was like auto unwrapping the promise because I need to just map over it. Yeah, like, yeah, oh, yeah. That, uh, that is one of the cool things. Uh, at least I think it's a cool feature to have, even though it's, uh, you know, in all normal circumstances you would say that it uses this as an mprop and then you call uses this and do a then function and having this that uses being the then function. However, in Mithril, the Mithril Promise API returns a amprop, 
and that amprop then gets populated with the results of the promise at the end of the then chain. So that really simplifies writing code like this. If you're simply getting something, you can use this pass in. Right, so it will just rerun the view when it changes. Yeah, yeah. There is a parameter in m.request that has background, and that is automatically set true, to true, and that means, uh, no, it's set to false, but false, sorry. And that means that at the end of the request chain, it is uh, everything is redrawn. Yeah. Cool. Hmm. I think it's pretty far fetched to compare this to uh, React. It's not giving an example how you communicate between components. That is a good point. That is absolutely and a wonderful <laughs> point. It definitely makes no sense at, on one slide and then comparing it to React on another. Uh, did I compare it to React? Did I? Did I? I mean, oh, oh yeah, the rendering speed. Yeah, that, that's right. I did compare a single render to React. Um, I really don't like comparing these two frameworks for mostly because uh, Mithril is an MVC framework, while well, React is a templating engine. So if we wanted to compare just those parts, yeah, I, I, would, I would definitely go for it. But yeah, providing an example of of components interacting. Uh, what you would normally do is use m.component uh, as we did in this example here. Here you see the app here is actually um, running uh, running code which creates a controller whose data is this data. The current user is the, f is the second argument of the data R array and the change user function is something that changes the array. As you can see here, uh, this component, the component that is actually being rendered here, is using m.component to render the select2 component. Okay. So that is sort of, yeah, that, that should answer your question, how, how they would interact. Am I being clear enough for you? Somewhat. Somewhat, yeah. <laughs> but like, let's say that we have you know, you know I, I don't really have any complex examples. I only have these tri yeah. trivial ones prepared. No, no, I don't want to sound like a React advocate at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like basically, like what if, what if, like if 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 they're going to be compared, then we have to like <coughs> also discuss how um, yeah. So how, what's what's the statefulness of method? Like how can we how how will I how will I check the state on on a on an element? All oh, right, in in in, 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 all right. Now in we're com now we're comparing MVC okay. to Flex, not React to Mithril, right? Okay, right. That, that's your question. Yeah. In a sense. Well, in, in, in a sense. All right. Uh, well, Mithril's kind of uh, view on on that subject okay. is that you shouldn't need Flex in the first place. If you write models that are not that don't error violently. No, uh, as I've seen Flux, as I've seen Flux use, I think it's I always kind of you know you write your models, and they can get into states which you do not want the user to see. And then you create these complex dispatches to kind of get away from that state. Um, Mithril, however, the, the philosophy is write models that don't error violently. Okay. <coughs> you understand where I'm coming from, right? <laughs> Anything else? I'll be happy to talk to you later. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. Right, have time. Yeah. What, is the only, what, what do you find to be the only downside or the downsides of using Mithril? Can you repeat the question? Uh, he asked about the downside of using Mithril. And I would have to say uh, it's got a really small community at the moment. Uh, and and you know if if you wanted a native a native way to do anything, it's really hard to find uh, when you compare like the plugin ecosystems of React and Angular and things like that to the plugin system of Mithril. It's still really in its infancy, and there's not really anything that you can kind of just take and put into your project right away. Does Mithril have like five K stars on GitHub? Yeah. <laughs> Why are people not contributing? I think it's because everybody think uh, everybody's writing code in their own way, and there's no sort of you know it's not sort of a window locking situation, and uh, you know you're writing code your way, and you don't necessarily know if there are any kind of best practices in the world of Mithril to go go after, so you kind of just don't contribute. Well, I 
someone just pissed you on someone else's wife? Maybe. <laughs> or maybe they just switched Rio to keep their stars. <laughs> Yeah, I'm um, using it uh, for, uh, we're up to, uh, I think, around 4 megabytes in source code uh, at work at Activity Stream uh, using our client as written in Mithril. Yeah.